agreement that's actually required for some of the funding for the public transit services, but it's also a really good opportunity to look at your transit system, see what works well or what could be improved. Um, and uh, the first steps of that are to gather a lot of data. We look at the demographics of the area, we look at um, the ridership of the transit system, the cost, the uh, ridership per hour, all that kind of information. We do a really deep dive into the existing conditions. And we did uh, a report that was uh, out last fall that summarizes all our, our initial findings from our data collection. And then we take that and we also have a lot of public outreach at that point. And we, t we take that and knowing what the, the issues are, we come up with a lot of service alternatives. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, we look at route alternatives, span of service. We also are looking at microtransit. Um, this is in our second document, and both of these documents are on the RABA website. There's links to it. Um, but this is the, the information on the, the transit service alternatives. Once we get feedback from staff and the public, and we hear back from you on our ideas, um, we will take the best ideas and develop them into a five-year implementation plan, and that will be the final chapter of the, the final report. So we'll have these two documents combined in the final chapter, and that will be available early this summer. So we're hoping today that we'll get some feedback from you on some of our ideas. Um, the study goals, we want to right size the transit service. And what I mean by that is you have a very large region to serve. Ridership has been declining. How do you make the system fit uh, your needs while also using, um, staying with the uh, available resources? Uh, we evaluate service options that we heard about from the public. So some of these ideas are requests um, for increased service or different areas. We also look at uh, service ideas based on the performance of the existing services. So when we looked at the existing conditions, what we learned about Reading and, and the Reading area is that um, the urban area is actually growing faster than the rural areas, which is good for transit. It's easier to serve urban areas. Um, but Reading has a higher proportion of elderly persons and people with disabilities and people um, living in poverty than California as a whole, which does tend to influence your um, transportation needs. We took all the demographic data that we had and we made a, what we call a transit index, um, transit needs index, and we mapped that based on the, the census tracts. Um, and you can see, or maybe not, but I'll tell you about it, um, the more urban areas have uh, greater need, obviously, um, and, the, and the outlying areas have less need. Um, looking at RABA, RABA has 10 local routes that run mostly on hourly headways. Um, they're pr approximately 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. weekdays. They start a couple hours later on Saturdays, and Shasta Connect provides some Sunday service. There's a couple commuter routes on top of that um, from Anderson, and there's what we call the Crosstown Express, which goes between the Masonic Transit Center and the um, Canby Transit Center. Uh, there's the School Express, which goes out to Shasta College. Uh, there's complementary paratransit, um, as part of the Americans with Disabilities Act, we need to provide transportation for those who cannot use the fixed routes, and those are within, um, well, mandated to be within three quarters of a mile, but they're further than that in some instances. Uh, there's also the Bernie Express, which goes from Bernie to Redding. Um, that is a Shasta County service, but it is operated by RABA. In terms of performance um, and ridership, if you consider the last decade, um, ridership has dropped significantly. Um, we have over 800,000 um, a decade ago that uh, rides per year. And when we say a, a passenger trip, that's when every time a person um, steps up onto the bus, that is a passenger trip. And when they get off, then that's the end of the trip. So. 
10 years ago it was 800,000, and it's been declining. It declined even before COVID, but then COVID, of course, had a very big impact on ridership, as it did nationally. Uh, in 2021, or 2020, 2021, it was just over 300,000 passenger trips. Um, and it's, uh, it was about 330,000 last year. Um, happy to say it's trending more towards about 375,000 this year. So it is starting to recover and we expect that as things get back to normal somewhat, it will return somewhat, but at the same time, uh, remote work is here to stay. Remote schooling um, has increased. So there, there will be a different demand than there used to be in the past. Some of the things that we've done in the past for this project to, to reach out to the community, we had um, onboard passenger surveys. So we got riders or our surveyors rode the buses uh, last summer and handed out surveys. They were also available to do online. So we got a good response from that. And that helped us learn about um, passenger uh, travel patterns and demographics and their wishes and desires and also their concerns and their, their ranking of different factors. We surveyed the community and the Shasta College students on an online survey, got a pretty good response from the students. Uh, I interviewed a lot of stakeholders, including a few of you in this room, um, and that was good for getting some of the, the background data, the, the politics of the area, and some of the big issues that um, are of concern. Uh, and then we presented the, the Tech Memo 1, all the existing con um, conditions, in a prior public workshop. And we also held a, a pop-up pop event down at the Transit Center to present our findings there. So for alternatives analysis, we're going to look at service alternatives, um, which are route options, et cetera. Um, also capital alternatives, which are bus stops and buses and fare analysis and some marketing strategies. Those are all the things that we evaluated. The types of service alternatives that we evaluated um, are a few categories of those. First, we looked at reducing route length um, to improve on-time performance. All of the routes run a little hot, which means that they, they have trouble staying on time and they have trouble, um, it's difficult to get driver breaks, so we wanted to look at ways to improve the routes by cutting them just a little bit each. Um, we also looked at route realignments to eliminate per poor performance or serve new areas, and we looked at microtransit, which I'll talk about in a minute, and we looked at span of service alternatives, which would be either extending or reducing the the hours served each day or the days of the week. Um, I have a graph here that shows some of the routes that like Route 1 and Route 3 only run on time 72% of the time, which is why we are looking at ways to try to reduce those, some of those routes. So I have a list of some of the alternatives, I mean some of the routes that we looked at shortening and some of the ways that we looked at shortening. I won't go through each of these, um, but I'll, I'll talk about how we evaluate these. We have a chapter that talks about um, performance standards and based on existing performance and a reasonable expectations, we have performance standards for different areas like dial ride doesn't, isn't expected to generate as much ridership as say the um, downtown routes. Um, so when we look at the services alternatives performance, we look at how many rides they generate per hour and what the cost of that would be, and we compare that to the performance measures to see if they fit within those to help decide if there are uh, a good alternative or a poor alternative. Some of the uh, potential changes that we looked at for the fixed routes are to eliminate the Crosstown Express altogether. That is the poorest performing route. Um, so it's a lot of, and it's a, every half hour 
but the ridership is just uh, about three passengers an hour, so pretty, pretty low ridership for how many resources go into it. We also looked at extending the Crosstown Express to Walmart so that at least it would be a more useful route. Um, so we'll talk about the performance on that. We looked at uh, serving Route 2 East every 30 minutes instead of serving the CTE every 30 minutes. So it'd be kind of a, fl a flip of those two routes on, on the frequency. We looked at um, routes three and nine meeting at the Wind River Mini Mart. Um, so that brings route nine up further north than it goes now. And that would allow route three to go out to the new Costco. Um, that we looked at doing that with uh, route nine running hourly, which would be pretty expensive, but we also looked at it running just on the peak hours as it does now. Um, and then we looked at extending Route 4 to the new Costco, and we looked at eliminating the Anderson commuter. We also looked at a lot of microtransit uh, options, and microtransit, um, it's kind of like Uber, it's kind of like between Uber and paratransit, but it's, you would use an app on your phone, um, or you could call in if you would prefer, but you can arrange a ride um, on a, on a short-term basis, same day, and t rides are typically provided within 15 to 30 minutes, depending on how big of the area is and, and how many vehicles are operating. And it, it works a lot like an Uber or a Lyft, but it's run by the public transportation system. Um, some other microtransit services have started in, in recent years. Um, there are some successful examples in Sacramento, Reno, Bakersfield, Napa. Um, and what we looked at are five zones, including a, a north zone, which would be up around um, the Masonic Transit Center and, and north of there. Uh, the west zone, which would be west of downtown. We looked at a downtown zone. I could, I guess I could be, oops. So this is the north zone, downtown zone, uh, west zone, east zone, and um, Anderson, city of Anderson zone. We also looked at unconstrained options and constrained options. And what that means, the unconstrained options are what resources would you need to put out there to serve all of the transit demand with microtransit? That would be an unconstrained, say you, you, vehicles are unlimited, how much would it take to do that? And then the constrained options look at, okay, if we have a set number of vehicles, how much service could we provide? And that kind of gives us the, the top end and lower end of what's possible in microtransit and, and gives us a means of, of evaluating those. First, we looked at microtransit only options. What happens if we just, <coughs> excuse me, what happens if we just removed my, uh, fixed routes altogether on the RABA system and replaced it with microtransit? And we looked at that for, um, weekdays from six to seven and Saturdays from eight to seven. We looked at it both under constrained conditions and unconstrained conditions. We looked at it for peak hours. We looked at it for Saturdays and Sundays. And what we found that in, in all of these options was that um, there's a huge increase in the operating costs with generally only minor improvements in ridership. Um, there's also, or there's big increases in operating costs plus ridership loss, or small increase in costs but a large increase in uh, loss of ridership. So for that, for, for microtransit to replace fixed route um, really is not a viable option. But that's still a good exercise for us to find out that. Then we looked at combinations of fixed route and microtransit. We looked at eliminating, this is the um, downtown zone. We could eliminate 
the um, two east, which could be served by microtransit and Route 3. Route 3 would um, go down uh, market instead to exit town. The um, Route 5 could be streamlined to go directly out of town on, on Cypress Street. It would eliminate a lot of bus, st bus stops, which could be a money-saving thing because if you have fewer bus stops, you have fewer to maintain, although there is some um, advertising at some of the stops, so that, that would be considered to also. Um, it, it only it eliminates half a vehicle, so it's not a super pr um, productive alternative. It would only gain you 100 passenger trips and it would cost 31900 in operating costs. And when I mention the operating costs, what we're looking at are the, the variable costs, the costs that would change per hour for the system, or per, per hour and mile. So um, we're not looking at fixed costs, we're just looking at what it would change by adding or subtracting service. We also looked at the um, north microtransit zone. I can go back here, that's this area. Up here, and we could by doing that, uh, um, serving that area, we could shorten routes one and seven. Which I don't know if you noticed, but those had on-time performance issues. But it would require running a, a microtransit bus um, for the entire day. So you would add just four thousand passenger trips, but it would cost over two hundred five thousand dollars. We looked at uh, microtransit and fixed routes in the east transit microtransit zone. Um, routes four and five could be combined, and um, route six south would be eliminated, and all that area would be served by microtransit instead. The um, microtransit would also go up to the Canby uh, transit hub to meet buses there upon request. It would require, in the unconstrained option, it would require two vehicles at peak, which would add 1,100 passenger trips a year at a cost of $36,000, because you're also eliminating some service on the fixed route. And the constrained option would um, require just one vehicle. You'd lose 1,300 passenger trips, but it would only be 14,000 in operating costs. Looking at the west microtransit zone, again, this is west of the downtown transit center, um, more into some neighborhoods where uh, the two west serves. Route two west would be eliminated and, and that would be served by microtransit instead. That would add about 800 passenger trips a year at a cost of $4,300. Um, the, looking at my, the downtown and the west microtransit combined, you could eliminate both the two west and the two east. Um, routes, and you could streamline routes three and five. In the unconstrained option, that would add 200 passenger trips and cost 15,200. And in the constrained, you'd lose 10,400 passenger trips, um, which is significant, but you also would have 147,000 annual savings by doing that. Uh, looking at the Anderson microtransit zone, um, what we came up with for that area is um, we have the microtransit zone and then we have Route 9 and the, we would use one van to serve microtransit in the city of Anderson and every two hours that van would come out of microtransit and go do a, a run up to the Wind River to meet the, the um, Route 3 and then come back down and enter into microtransit service again. Um, that would add 6,800 passenger trips a year, but it'd be um, 177,000 in operating costs. For the increased span of service, we looked at providing Sunday service from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we looked at routes um, 3, 4, 11, and 14 and continuing with paratransit, obviously. And that would add 9,600 passenger trips at a cost of 128,000 um, in marginal operating costs annually. And we haven't looked at, when we talked with staff the other day, we, they mentioned that you know maybe you could do this with just uh, 
three, four, and 14 rather than 11. Um, so we'll have to look at the numbers for that, but it's probably a little um, less ridership, but obviously less cost too. So that might be an option. Uh, later weekday service to 9.15 p.m., same routes. That would add 13,400 passenger trips, um, but it would cost 275,000 a year. Reduced span of service. Um, we looked at ending service at 615. And this is a tough one because a lot of our comments from our surveys are that they would like to see expanded evening service. But when you look at the data, it's not really supported. After 5 p.m., 6 p.m., the ridership just drops significantly. So ending the service at, at 615 would lose 5,300 passenger trips a year, but it'd save $210,800 a year. Um, eliminating routes five and seven on Saturdays would uh, reduce passenger trips by 3,800 a year and save 85,000. And again, we measured these all against the performance standards that are, are talked about in the report. Um, we look at ridership gains and losses and the cost per passenger trip. So back to those alternatives that reduce the, the length of the trips, almost all of those um, meet the performance standards. Um, they meet the standards either by eliminating a service that's not meeting the existing standard or by increasing ridership while decreasing costs. So all of those meet that, especially, well, if um, reducing Route 5, which has a big long loop at the end, if you cut that back, you save um, $9,400, which isn't a lot, but it's only, um, it actually increases ridership by 100 passengers a year because it's more fifth, um, more, it's better travel time for the passengers that are on there, so you're more likely to get passengers on there. The only one that didn't meet this was eliminating the Lake Boulevard north of Oasis on the, Route 1, um, up north of the Masonic Center, which both lost money and lost ridership. Um, changes to the existing routes, these, uh, Eliminating the, the Crosstown Express does meet performance standards, as does eliminating the Anderson commuter. Both of those are poor performing routes, so cutting them would be a benefit, at least in terms of ridership and money. There are always other considerations. Um, on the microtransit alternatives, as mentioned before, none of the ones that completely replace fixed routes make any um, performance sense, but in terms of ones that mix with the um, alternate, with the zones and the rider, the, sorry, the fixed route changes, um, services with the downtown and the west microtransit make some good sense. Uh, increases ridership by 3.5 passengers an hour at a cost of 14, 15 per passenger trip. And services changes in the east microtransit zone also make sense. Um, and then with the west microtransit, um, it's financially it makes it meets the requirement, but not in the number of rides carried per hour. The span of service um, increasing the hours does not meet the performance standards, but cutting back does. So we, I know that's a lot of information that you've gotten just now, but we have a list of the ones that we would further recommend based on the performance, and then a list of some that are neutral, and then some that we think should be dismissed. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're hoping that we'll get feedback from you, and it doesn't have to be today. You can take some, we have some uh, comment cards at the front, and there's a, a QR code on the back that you can scan and fill it out online. But we would love to hear back from you on which of these alternatives you think are most preferable or which you um, don't care to see. So on the ones that we uh, currently recommend for further consideration, that would be eliminating the Caterpillar Loop, which goes just north of the um, 
the shopping area north of Masonic. Um, and that would still be served in the opposite direction by Route 7. Uh, operating to west either um, only in the clockwise, con if you're going to keep to west, then we think it's better to operate it in one direction only, which would be clockwise. Um, eliminating the park marina loop of two east and having it go more directly out of town or south on Market Street would be an improvement. Uh, removing stop on uh, Maraglia Street because that's just kind of a uh, excess little loop that goes out to the to the school there and it's within a quarter mile of the, the main route and people could walk that. Um, shortening the the Route 5 as I had mentioned earlier so it's got that big loop out there. Alternatives to consider or eliminate um, sorry alternatives to change or eliminate routes or add microtransit. Eliminating the Crosstown Express. I've mentioned that several times but that's something that uh, should definitely be considered. Extending the Route 3 so that it serves Costco um, makes it makes performance standards. Extending Route 4 to Costco. Now you don't need to do both of those, but those are options that we're looking at. Eliminating the Anderson commuter and the downtown microtransit zone with changes. Those are all the best performing um, alternatives in the, in the analysis. Some that are neutral that have both pros and cons and are kind of um, even with the, the performance standards are to operate the two east every 30 minutes and the CTE hourly. Um, eliminate on Route 3, eliminate the loop east of 273. Um, although we've talked, I've talked with Hallie about that and how that could be actually improved. But there are ways to shorten Route 3 a little bit that, that are kind of neutral. Um, east microtransit zone and associated route changes are kind of neutral, as are the um, west microtransit zone and associated routes, the downtown and west microtransit zones and associated routes, and the Anderson microtransit zone. And I'm sorry I'm going to read all through this, but I know we have some, some sight impaired, so I want to, to cover that. And the Sunday fixed route service, and ending weekday service at 6.15 p.m., eliminating routes five and seven on Saturdays. These are all kind of pros and cons. If you have strong feelings about them uh, for reasons that aren't um, ridership or cost-driven, then we, we'd want to talk about that. Alternatives that we recommend for dismissal, um, some of the shortening some of the routes, there's a couple of those. Extending Route 3 to Costco and operating Route 9 hourly, that doesn't make sense. Um, and extending service, weekday service to 915 um, weekdays, even though that's something popular w among passengers, it really doesn't pan out financially. Replacing microtransit with, I mean, a fixed route with microtransit doesn't pan out, nor does the microtransit zone on the north side. We also were asked to look at um, service to the VA clinic. Um, the VA clinic is pretty far out of town, um, but there is need for, for people to go out there, um, and a lot of the people that go out there are, are uh, not able to drive. So some of the options we looked at for serving the VA clinic including include um, developing a, vo a volunteer mileage reimbursement program, which is something that Tehama County has and is pretty successful. Um, you can have it be very informal where you just find um, drivers who use their own vehicles and you reimburse them, or you can recruit the drivers, train them, and use those, or you can actually provide the vehicles um, through a, like a nonprofit entity. We also looked at um, what would it take to run a couple of vehicle or a couple of trips out there every day. Uh, we looked at a round trip at 9, 10 in the morning and 3, 10 in the afternoon. Um, any more service than that, you're not going to get enough ridership. But at the same time, it's hard to uh, make sure that you know those. The, it means that people who are going on the bus 
are probably going to be at the VA hospital for a, a long time during the day and their trips, their appointments have to fall within those hours. Um, still, it would add 500 passenger trips a year at a cost of about 21,800. That's uh, per passenger cost of 4360, which is um, definitely exceeds the performance standard, but it is one way to provide service there. We also, um, just after talking with staff, came up with an alternative um, to have the east microtransit zone, which I can go back to. This area, um, could be extended so that it would serve down to the clinic and the airport. And that would be one way to serve the VA. That would add 10,600 passenger trips a year. It would cost 150,000 almost. So it would be a, a high cost, but that's $14 a passenger trip and that does meet the standards. Um, capital alternatives that we looked at, um, it, we talk about the needs for replacement. We don't have a specific plan yet because we developed the capital plan when we know what service um, options are selected. So the number of vehicles will really depend on which alternatives are, dis are chosen. But the vehicle um, replacement plan basically is uh, based on the useful life benchmark that the federal government comes up with. They say your vehicles will, you know, this class of vehicle will last seven years or 12 years or whatever it is. So 10 vehicles need to, and 12 vehicles, sorry, 10 fixed route vehicles and 12 paratransit vehicles need to be replaced within the time period of the short range transit plan. And all of those with, are within the next couple of years, so they could be replaced by gas or diesel, except for two of them, which will be replaced uh, later in, in uh, the requirements at that time will be for zero emission vehicles to, to be purchased. The estimated cost for um, the five-year purchase of vehicles just for replacements of the existing fleet would be about $8.2 million, and RABA would be responsible for $1.9 million of that with local match. Um, the study is also recommending uh, a, a further study of the Masonic Transit Center. Um, right now, it's just buses that park along the road. They go down that road and make a, a turn on a court. The one day I went up to look at it, there were emergency vehicles for a homeless encampment and buses had to do a three-point turn, you know, these large buses, so it's really not an adequate um, transit center and that should be studied further. Um, also, we would look at eliminating the unused bus stops if we do have microtransit. Um, as I mentioned, TMD did some study on the, on the fares, and their key goals for the, the fare strategy are to keep the fares affordable, um, to attract new riders, especially youth, because if you get the young people dry, uh, riding now, then you will build a, a long-term base for riders. Um, keep the, the fares simple. Um, and that's basically the, the main thrust of the recommendations is to kind of sim simplify the fare structure. Uh, people will use it more willingly if they understand it easily. You do need to generate fare revenue, so that's important. And then um, you want to make the payment and collection effective and efficient. So. The, the strongest recommendation is for eliminating the, the zones. There's different fares by zone and that makes it more equitable in a way because you, you go further and you pay more, but it's very complicated. It kind of slows down the process and it doesn't generate enough benefit really to be worthwhile. And some of the passes therefore are eliminated. Um, no changes to the paratransit um, and re recommending fares, um, free fares for youth ages six to um, 17, which is currently $29. And then there's um, 
some discussion of marketing strategies for improving the website and uh, the print materials. Um, as much as electronics are important, people still do like their, their print materials. Um, establishing and maintaining a good social media presence is always important. Uh, people use Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all of those uh, instruments, and that's a good way to get your message out. You can tweet your, um, your delays or your issues with your, your transit service or your upcoming events. And um, participating in events is another way to get uh, a lot of good outreach and feedback. Um, I know Hallie has something planned for the, the festival in, or the fair in, in June, and to have RABA have a presence there is a great outreach and marketing tool. So I know that's a whole lot of information, but I thank you for bearing with me and listening to this. Um, again, we have some comment cards that have, have a list of the top um, recommendations there, and we'll hope you will look at that and give us some feedback. Check the RABA website for updates and for, for you can go in and read the study reports um, or fill out a comment card online and spread the word to your, your friends and constituents about the study and what we're considering and tell them if they have thoughts about RABA, now is the time to share them. Um, I have business cards up there, but my, I'm at selena at lsctrans.com and I'd love to hear back from you. So I will open it up for any questions or comments. Yes? We do, that usually involves a, a longer term study for, you know, a whole, I mean, they, that would be a bus stop placement study. Yes, that's true. And we do recommend, you know, our, our plan is more general than that, where we recommend um, maintenance a maintenance budget for the shelters and if we think there's a key location where a, a stop is needed or like you said where there's a very big problem with crossing that is something we consider so yeah no well, that's important information to know so I would love it if you would write that down in the comment card and we can take a look at that and see Yeah, and that, that is another consideration when you um, implement microtransit service. There's, you know, usually it's, it, it, there's two ways to do it. It can be curb to curb or it can be um, like corner to corner. So that's something that you would need to take into consideration, especially in rural areas like that, what, because you obviously have to pick up in safe locations. So that's something that would need to be discussed. In access to the locations, right? No, you can only go within the zone. But, but you can go to the Canby Transit Center and then you can transfer to routes that go to other zones. The Canby? No, that's on the east side. It's pretty close to the east zone. 
Yeah. And then the other ones are within, they have transit centers within them. So you, you would stay within the zone, but you could go to the transit center and, and catch a fixed route from there. Yes, sir, in the red shirt. It's not quite a spoke system right now because of the way there, there are three hubs, you know, the downtown, the Masonic, and the, the Canby. And some of them are kind of the flower loops and some of them are more out and back. Um, but we did look at ways to try to improve the, the alignments of the routes. But it's harder to serve the area that you're trying to serve with a spoke system than with the, the loops that we have now. The downtown. Oh yeah, there are actually there are quite. If you look at our boarding and lighting maps, there's a lot of people getting off in different, not just the downtown, but a lot of little locations in there, and all of the routes that go to the downtown, they make kind of circuitous loops through the downtown and by providing microtransit, they could just jet in and jet out from the downtown transit center instead of looping through the downtown. That's the benefit of it. And, you know, there's a pros and cons. It's one of the ones that's kind of neutral unless you combined it with the west route. I mean west, sorry, microtransit zone. Uh, other questions? Comments, thoughts? Yes. I think in the Hanger report that um, Captain Thompson said that there were a number of other stops and that this was just an example of the sort that you brought out the idea of these two services where the designs of the commercial side really fit Thank you. Yeah, the, um, the idea of paying as you go on your transit pass, um, other transit services do use that, and that does help with people who are really kind of living paycheck to paycheck or, you know, day to day. So other questions or comments? Well, I thank you all for being here. I hope you'll pick up a, a comment card. Um, and feel free to come up and ask questions. And um, yeah, all right. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Are they on the table here? Let me help you with that.